God's house of prayer and his house in heaven. The northern kingdom of Samaria was inhabited by Gentiles, imported by the Assyrians, who had defeated the Israelites of the north before the Assyrians were defeated by the Babylonians. The Babylonians, who later defeated the southern kingdom of Judah and deported them to the lands of Assyria, Babylonia, eventually Persia, completed the total exile of the 13 tribes of Israel from the lands of Abraham. Uh, the North Kingdom was also called Israel, uh, of course Samaria, and Ephraim. Then the king of Assyria marched against the whole land. He came to Samaria and besieged it for three years. In the ninth year of Hoshi, the king of Assyria captured Samaria. He deported the Israelites to Assyria and settled them in Halak at the river Habor, at the river Gazan, and in the towns of Medea. That's 2 Kings, chapter 17, verses 5 and 6. The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kuta, Abba, Hamak, and Sepharvan, and he settled them in the towns of Samaria in place of the Israelites. They took possession of Samaria and dwelt in its towns. That's 2 Kings 17, verse 24. They worshipped the Lord, but they also appointed from their own ranks priests of the shrines to officiate for them in the cult places. They worshipped the Lord while serving their own gods, according to the practices of the nations from which they had been deported. To this day, they followed their former practices. They do not worship the Lord properly. They do not follow the laws and practices, the teaching and instruction that the Lord enjoined upon the descendants of Jacob, who was given the name Israel, with whom he made a covenant and whom he commanded. You shall worship no other gods. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them. That's 2 Kings, chapter 17, verse 32 through 35. God said, As for the foreigners <coughs> who attach themselves to the Lord to minister to Him and to love the name of the Lord, to be His servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it, and who hold fast to my covenant, I will bring them to my sacred mount and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices shall be welcome on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. That's Isaiah chapter 56, verses 6 through 7. In Judaism today, this would mean converting to Judaism applied to foreigners, including Christian Israelis and Muslim Israelis. If they want to enter the third temple, they must hold fast to God's covenant with the Jewish people. They must follow the laws and practices, the teaching and instruction that the Lord enjoined upon the descendants of Jacob, who was given the name Israel, with whom he made the covenant. A house of prayer for all people is a house of prayer for all Jewish people who are people from the nations of the earth. God knew they would be defeated, deported, and dispersed throughout the world. This was a part of God's plan when he formed Israel for the new heaven he was creating. He chose them and the land for them and had the Hebrew Bible in its entirety written at his command and direction through his anointed ones and his prophets. God 
is creating a new heaven of the spirits and souls of the Jewish people for the name of Israel to endure. Those who are righteous and in right standing with him will be placed in angelic bodies as a new host of the Lord of hosts, a host of angels representing the people of the world, the angels of Israel. And that's why it's a house of prayer for all peoples, all Jewish people. And you can't be worshiping false gods as those that have been imported in the northern kingdom. Eli Weasel said in regard to God in the Holocaust and the lost version of night. Quote, this time we will not stand as the accused in court before the divine judge. This time we are the judges. And he is the accused. We are ready. There are a huge number of documents in our indictment file. They are living documents that will shape the foundations of justice. Job was also ready to indict God. Job wanted God to explain to him why he, as a righteous man who followed the Lord's commandments, and so many bad things happening to him. I am sure that God is quite pleased with creation because he is perfect. And all things he creates are perfectly what he wanted for him. It is perfect for creating a heaven of angelic human spirit persons. A new heaven by the addition of a new host of angels, angels Israel. God decided to create a new host of angels, one where he does not create their personalities as with the angels of heaven, but angelic persons who were formed as persons by their own actions and self-will. Unlike angels, we are put through a battleground of choices with our own self-will that molds and shapes us as persons. Angels do not have self-will or a battleground of choices to make. Their persons are created and formed by God. God knew in the beginning that all men would suffer, the good and the bad. It is what makes our personality suitable for His purpose of creating a new host of angels. Quote, For behold, I am creating a new heaven and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered. They shall never come to mind. Be glad then and rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I shall create Jerusalem as a joy and her people as a delight. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in her people. Never again shall be heard there the sounds of weeping and wailing. It's Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 through 19. Quote, No more shall there be an infant or graybeard who does not live out his days. He who dies at a hundred years shall be reckoned a youth, and he who fails to reach a hundred shall be reckoned a curse. They shall build houses and dwell in them. They shall plant vineyards and enjoy their fruit. They shall not build for others to dwell in or plant for others to enjoy. For the days of my people shall be as long as the days of a tree. My chosen ones shall outlive the work of their hands. They shall not toil to no purpose. They shall not bear children for terror, but they shall be a people blessed by the Lord, and their offspring shall remain with them. That's Isaiah chapter 65, verses 20 to 23. And there's a reason I broke it up like that, because it could have all gone together. <coughs> In verses 17 through 19, God is speaking of a spiritual heaven that he calls Jerusalem. Verses 20 through 23 are what heaven was believed to be like for the people of the ancient age and the Middle Ages. God's scripture, scripture is written for eras gone by, and heirs to come. 
People of ancient times in the Middle Ages thought of the dead coming back to life and living long lives in a brutal, savage time of humanity. Planting vineyards and enjoying the fruit and not having it taken by others, dwelling in a home they had built, and not toiling for others was the heaven they thought of, not a spiritual heaven where you rise to God and live with Him. To them, God was always angry and the cause of their troubles. I mean, if you think about it, with no medicine, no science, no knowledge, no schooling, no universities, when you had lost your loved one, the spouse would walk out to the graveside and just go, I wish you could come up out of there and come back to me. That's, how, that's as far as they could think of it. They, they weren't thinking, wish you got into the hospital, wish you had eaten better foods, wish you hadn't drank so much. So it was just, I wish you could come out of the ground and be with me. That's heaven to them. And today it's still prayed for by Orthodox as a fundamental principle of, of Judaism in the 13 principles of Rambam. Billions of people is what you're talking about appearing out of nowhere in the land of Israel. I don't know that you can fit them all in. For as the new heaven and the new earth which I shall make shall endure by my will, declares the Lord, so shall your seed and your name endure. Isaiah chapter 66 verse 22. God says he is creating a new heaven and a new earth. The new earth will be just as this is, earth is, when this earth is no more, when the final judgment of entry to heaven is made by the Creator who holds the souls of all men in his hand. The new heaven where the seed and name of Israel shall endure. And God will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in her people while the new earth is being formed. God calls the new heaven Jerusalem as a direct reference to heaven being for the Jewish people with the name Israel shall endure. Quote, I am sending an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have made ready. Pay heed to him and obey him. Do not defy him, for he will not pardon your offenses, since my name, Hashem, is in him. But if you obey him and do all that I say, I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. Genesis chapter 23 verses 20-22. In heaven, God is in you as my name is in the angel of his presence. That is what is meant when God says, before they pray, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will respond. The information of our minds gathered by our eyes and ears is interpreted by our spirit and soul. Interpreted. It's not where your thoughts are. If that's true, there can be no heaven for any of us because our mind turns to dust. The spirit that God gives us, an element of the unseen realm of God, literally translates the little electrical signals and the chemicals and the, the, the tissue of the brain in different areas, different loads, which is the person that we are, our spirit and soul. Our spirit can read the electrical impulses, chemicals, and different tissues of various parts of the mind. In heaven, our spirit and soul no longer has a mind filled with information to interpret. Spirit is very complicated element of the unseen realm of God. God will be the source of that information. In a sense, God becomes your mind. He provides the information for your spirit to interpret. God can be the information of your mind and the information for every angel and spirit of heaven at the same time. Jesus tells us that he will return in the time of lies and being. The life of the high priest. Oh, uh, I've been asked to, to tell you that uh, I have a lot more on this um, 
God providing the information of your mind in a video um, that is Messianic era versus day of the Lord. That's, there might be a little, few, few more words, but it's Messianic era versus day of the Lord. Uh, which is it? What's it going to be? Well, I don't think there's any question it's going to be day of the Lord. They don't go together. Jesus tells us that he will return in the times of lies and being. The life of the high priest who will see him return. The lives of the people of the towns of Caesarea Philippi been living. The generation of lies and being during his life. The lies of his disciples. And the lies of those who pierced him with the spear after he died on the cross. They're all dead now for 2,000 years. Jesus spoke five prophecies of his return with a specific time frame, lies in being, the measuring lines, and the prophecies all fail. The Apostle Paul said, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That, of course, is the rapture. And that just came from Paul. And that's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 through 17 of the Holy Bible, King James Version. Jesus said he was coming back quickly. On the last page of the Holy Bible, in the book of Revelation, Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. This went over side to fail. I don't know how much faith you want to put in there. Revelation chapter 22, verse 7. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Revelation Chapter 22, verse 12. He which testified these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Revelation, chapter 22, verse 20. There's three more prophecies <laughs> that did not come true. Of course, he's already gone at this time, but he still doesn't come back. And he's talking from heaven through an angel to a writer called John. He may... By all accounts, it's not John the disciple. Uh, although he tries to indicate it is him. Jesus has never returned. For almost 2,000 years, the dead in Christ and those alive during those years have waited to rise to heaven. His prophetic announcement did not happen. There are no Christians in heaven, according to Christianity. I don't think any of them even know that. <laughs> the time for a quick return has long passed. There is no reason or foundation to believe by faith or otherwise that he will ever return. Heaven is only for the Jewish people. If the Christians want to enter God's house of prayer on earth and his house in heaven, they will have to convert to Judaism. They will have to become Jews. Very observant Jews. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that. The commentary of Rashi and myself on Isaiah 52, verses 13 through 15, and all of Isaiah 53, describing God's righteous servant, the Moshiach. According to my commentary, which includes commentary on the commentary of Russia. Russia's commentary is that the man being described is Israel, which means it's not the Moshiach of chapter 11. And which also means we have no description of him. 
52, 13. Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up. And he shall be very high. Rashi. This is Midrash form. He takes parts of verses and comments on the parts. And he'll, he doesn't necessarily take all the verse, but the parts he wants to comment on. And this is how he starts. Behold, my servant shall prosper. Behold, this is Rashi now. Behold, at the end of days, my servant Jacob, i.e., the righteous among him, shall prosper. Keith. And I'm using the JPS. Uh, this is from Shabbat.org. Those are, they have the rendition that doesn't include the quotes between 13 and 15, and the quotes between verse 1 and 6 of uh, 53, the multiple quote verses. But this is from the JPS. Indeed, my servant shall prosper, be exalted, and raised to great heights. My commentary on that is, my servant is now the Gentile, and not the Gentiles, who becomes my righteous servant. In Isaiah 53, 11, after passing the test of devotion in Isaiah 53, 10. When he makes himself an offering for guilt in the covenant with God. From a sinful man whose life had been lowly, full of grievous events and serious injuries, a man of pain and suffering, familiar with disease, that the Spirit of God alights upon, to the crown of God's righteous servant who rises to great heights. This is uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 10. Chapter 11 begins with the Spirit of God that lights upon the tree of the shoot that grows from the stump of Jesse, where the ancestral tree of the kings of Judah has been cut down. That would be the line of Jesus in the book of Matthew. First thing you read in the New Testament. He can't be the man of chapter 11. Not, not just because that line was banished with Chaconia when Babylonia took over, uh, defeated the Jews, and destroyed the second temple, but because he doesn't come from the sun. That's why it's written that way. The stock of Jesse that has remained standing shall become a standard to peoples, nations shall seek his counsel, and his abode shall be honored. Again, Isaiah eleven ten. The abode of the righteous servant is humble when the Lord cuts him off from the land of the living, the world of material things in society. In Isaiah fifty three verse eight. And in the end the abode of the servant is one to be honored. In Isaiah chapter eleven verse ten. From a poor man to a rich man, with the many as his portion, and the multitude as his spoil, prosperous, and held in high regard by many, and a multitude of the Jewish people. Verse 14, as many wondered about you, how marred his appearance is from that of a man, and his features from that of people. Russian. That's, that's again from Shabbat.org and, and the commentary comes from, from them too. They have the commentary of Rashi on that. As many wondered, his answer, commentary, as many peoples wondered about them when they saw them in their humble state and said to one another, how marred is his Israel's it's in brackets, appearance from that of a man. See how their features are darker than those of other people? So, as we see with our eyes. It's Keith, verse 14. Just as the many were appalled at him 
So long was his appearance, unlike that of man, his form beyond human semblance. Commentary. So marred was his appearance unlike that of man. Based on Isaiah 53 verse 10 and its primary purpose, this is the beginning of identifying the righteous servant as a man with disfigurement, blemished, with disease. He is not a man without defect, such as lambs, sin offerings, and rams, or guilt offerings. In the Torah, that would be Leviticus. If I were to be seen with all of my injuries from accidents and surgical operations at one time before he, together with my con congenital disfigurement, my right shoulder and arm is withered, my appearance and features would be marred from that of a man and people, unlike that of normal men. That's important because. If he can find a way to describe, to describe uh, this man that's so marred and his parents, I mean, it sounds like somebody you never want to look upon him. But in this verse, verse 15, it is said, So shall he cast down many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for what had not been told them they saw. And what they had not heard, they gazed. Russia, what had not been told them, his answer, commentary, concerning any man they saw in him. They gazed. So shall he cast down many nations. Uh, he just puts a Hebrew word in here. I, I don't know. They gazed. It says Hebrew, Hebrew letters. And then again, he says, they gaze. So shall he cast down many nations. Rashi. So now, even he, his hand, will become powerful. And he will cast down the horns of the nations who scattered him. That would be the Jewish people scattering the nations. Becoming powerful. Shall shut. They shall shut their mouths out of great bewilderment for, he says, honor. They're going to shut their mouths, all this, uh, see what they had never uh, been told and hear what they had never heard. Or honor. Keep. Just so he shall startle many nations, kings shall be silenced because of him, for they shall see what has not been told them shall behold what they never have heard. My answer to that, nations, the Gentiles, startled, and kings, leaders of nations, silence. By seeing God's righteous servant, God's servant David, Elijah, and the prophet like Moses as one man. And hearing that God's righteous servant arise in the time to come of Jeremiah 31 and the day of the Lord. That God's righteous servant is the only man to come who is described in the scripture and is inherently and implicitly the anointed one David, Elijah, the prophet like Moses, of whom there is no description for identification. That the Jewish people throughout the world will be forgiven by God of all their inequities and sins by God's written word in the day of the Lord. That would be the new part of the new covenant, the new inclusion from Jeremiah 31. That heaven is being created for only the Jewish people. Christians will be surprised at that as well, Muslims. That God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53 is a Gentile, according to the scripture. That Jesus, being a Jew, cannot be God's righteous servant. That God's righteous servant is familiar with disease and crushed with disease, blemished, and could never be an offer for sacrifice. 
No man of Isaiah 53 can fit and offer sacrifice. That's why God blemishes him. That's why God chooses to crush him with disease. To make sure that just doesn't happen. Because he knew what the Gentiles were going to do with Leviticus. Then the host of the Lord's host is a man in divine beings. If the captain of the Lord's host is a Gentile host of the Lord's host and a harbinger of God's righteous servant. The God's righteous servant becomes a man in divine beings when God's spirit, who is the angel of his presence, and he is a person, the angel of the Lord, the Holy Spirit alights upon him in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 2, that God would really redeem the Jewish people and in the same manner that he did in the Hebrew Bible with one man. At the time to come of Jeremiah 31 began when the state of Israel was created in 1948. The God's righteous servant fulfills and completes the remaining six or so prophecies of God in the day of the Lord. Okay. This is uh, Isaiah 53, verse 1, begins with quotes, and the quotes end after verse 6. The first speakers of Isaiah 53 are the witnesses of the righteous servant, in the quoted multiple verses 1 through 6, the many who are made righteous by God's righteous servant. That's what the story is about. Verse 1, who would have believed our report? And to whom was the arm of the Lord revealed? Rashi. Who would have believed our report? Rashi. Commentary. So will the nations say to one another, Were we to hear from others what we see, it would be unbelievable. I'm not certain what they see, but I think it's the Messianic era. This is never going to occur. So I don't know how you can base your opinions, and I know Jews for Judaism for sure doesn't. That's so much Toby is saying of outreach Judaism. If you're going to base a description on a man you're trying to find on an event that has not occurred, whether it will or will not, what about the man who's being described if that is the case? What have you done? What if you don't recognize him other than destruction comes to the land of Israel? And right now, that would be the destruction of 7 million Israeli Jews. If you have been told by a prophet, both of you two, Jews for Jews, outright Jews, if, if your organizations have been told by a prophet, God said he was going to raise up on us if we didn't do this and we didn't do that. And we know what happened. Syria defeated the poor of the North Kingdom, South Kingdom, Judah. The Babylonians defeated and deported, and then Rome destroyed and defeated all of them and dispersed the Jews throughout the world. Because why? Because the prophet wasn't listening to it. The arm of the Lord, this is still Rashi, like this, with greatness and glory, to whom was it revealed until now? He's not a lot of explanation there, I'm not sure. Keith, who can believe what we have heard? Upon whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? My commentary. The witnesses ask, who can believe that God redeems the Jewish people by the new covenant with sin forgiveness that is delivered by the messenger Elijah, who receives it from the angel of the covenant, Elijah being a man of heaven, of course, who is the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, that alights upon the anointed one. In Isaiah chapter 11, 1 through 2. By the covenant of friendship that comes with his servant David, when he, and it's God, sanctifies Israel by having the third temple built on his holy Mount Zion in Jerusalem. I have to see, lost track here a little bit. Oh, who can believe what we have heard? Okay, that's what all these buys.
by speaking to his prophet. Again, as he spoke to Moses face to face and friend to friend. And all by and with one man the Lord calls my righteous servant. Chapter 12 of the laws concerning King Moshiach of Ramah. That Moshiach will compel all of Israel to walk in the way of the Torah, perfect the entire world, motivating all the nations to serve God together. There will be neither famine nor war, neither envy nor competition. The entire world will be solely to know God. And the Jews will, therefore, be great sages and know the hidden matters with an understanding of their creator to the full extent of human potential. Yet God simply says, and this comes through the two covenants of friendship in the sentence uh, in Jeremiah 31, see a time is coming, Jerusalem is rebuilt. At the end of that it says, they shall never be defeated and dispersed again. Here's what those say for the day of the Lord the era of the Moshiach, or the times of the anointed one in an awesome, fearful day of the Lord. Yet God simply says he will send down the rain in its season. The trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and the land shall yield its produce. The Jewish people shall continue secure on their own soil, never be overthrown and uprooted again. They shall no longer be a spoil for the nations. He will establish for them a planting of renown. And again, these kind of go in hand with see that the time is coming, the desolate land will bloom again, as I paraphrase it, of Jeremiah 31. They shall no more be carried off by famine. They shall have to bear again. They shall not have to bear again the taunts of the nations. He will establish them and multiply them. He will place his sanctuary among them forever. His presence shall rest over them. And when his sanctuary abides among them forever, the nations will know that the Lord sanctifies Israel. Who would believe that one man fulfills and completes the remaining prophecies of God in the day of the Lord? The remaining prophecy to be fulfilled is the delivery of two specific covenants and the arrival of God's righteous servant, who makes the many righteous, the anointed one, a shepherd, God calls my servant David, Elijah, who is taken to heaven and returns, and recounsels the members of the Jewish families one to the other through Judaism, Judaism, and righteousness, and the prophet like Moses. He wrote the Torah at the command and direction of God. The witness is for the poor and who would believe them. That they had not been told by their wise men, sages, rabbis, theologians, that God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53 is a Gentile. In the beginning. Isaiah 63 says God comes from the dawn that is interpreted in Judaism to be Christianity and means he is coming from a Christian country. Uh, in addition, a dawn, uh, which is long since gone, is in the country of Jordan, east of the River Jordan. It's Gentile lands. He's coming from Gentile lands. And there are the people, the Jewish people, none are with him. He comes with the Gentiles. Remember the captain of the Lord's host. Joshua asked him, are you an Israelite or one of us? He says, no. I'm the captain of the Lord's host. Now I've come. And then we never see him again. It's just three short verses. What are they about? They're about a man and divine being being a host of the Lord's host. He comes with a Gentile. Well, Jesus was a Jewish man who came from Nazareth. Can you see God working in this? <laughs> it's serious people. Isaiah 53 can't be him. He's a Jew. And God comes to the Gentiles. not like, I mean, Cyrus of Persia was a Gentile. Elijah's a Gentile. He, he's, he's, he, he's a Tishbite. You can't find a clan of Tishbites in any of the tribes according to the genealogies provided and 
He is an inhabitant. He's not from. He lives in Ramoth Gilead. Just to give you a frame of reference, he may as well have lived in Adam. It's a, it's a territory east of the River Jordan, north of Adam, and it's Arabs and Assyrians. And he lives there. The Jewish people did not come from Adam. They began the Promised Land, returned from Egypt in the Exodus, and were not allowed to pass through Adam. Huh. And returned from Europe after the Holocaust. Well, how's God coming anywhere if he doesn't have a man with him? How, how do we know anything about him if a man doesn't speak the words God tells him to speak? Did you think it was going to be a day of the Lord and he wasn't going to have a Moses? He's got a new covenant to deliver. It has to do with the first covenant. Well, who delivered it? Moses. It can't be the Jewish people. Okay, he's got to have a guy. One man, and he's got him described. He's a servant, he's righteous. So was King David, so was Elijah, and so was Moses. All servants, all righteous. One term, God's righteous servant. And I'm to believe from Rashi, Jews from Judaism, outreach Judaism, that today the Jews are the righteous servant. Good luck convincing me. The witness report that they had never heard that the captain of the Lord's host is a Gentile and a harbinger of God's righteous servant who becomes the host of the Lord's host. It's, it's easy to understand. A man of divine beings is not an angel. A man of divine beings is a man that the Spirit alights upon and like Ezekiel enters, God is in his spirit and then he speaks. We get that from Ezekiel. Chapter 11, Isaiah. Spirit of God and life upon him. God is in his spirit. He is now a man of divine being. Any prophet that said God says in his books was a man of divine being. You know, it's a task. It can be one task. It can be many tasks. One man just had to wrestle with Jeffrey. And God spoke. The divine beings, I know Judaism doesn't recognize the Holy Spirit for some unknown reason as a person. I don't know what could be more clear. It's just too many scriptural references. But that's a man of divine beings. Spirit lines on him. God's right there too. It's a man of divine beings, not an angel. The witness had never heard that the divine beings are the Holy Spirit who is the angel of his presence of Isaiah 63, an angel whose angelic body is not the form of a human with wings, but the very Spirit of God. And God, the very angel who went before the Israelites in the Exodus, and God was in him. Quote, this is God. I'm sending an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have made ready. Pay heed to him and obey him. Do not defy him, for he will not pardon your offenses, since my name is Hashem since Hashem is in him. But if you obey him and do all that I say, that would be God, not me, I will be an enemy to your enemies and a foe to your foes. That's Exodus chapter 23, verses 20 to 22. The witnesses have never heard that God created his spirit, is in his spirit, and his spirit is the body of the angel of his presence and the angel of the Lord. How the angel of the Lord is in the burning bush when God speaks to Moses. How a man divine beings wrestled with Jacob and God spoke to Jacob, renaming him Israel. How the ground was holy where Joshua fell to the ground before a Gentile with drawn sword and asked, What does my Lord command his servant? The captain of the Lord's host answered Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Joshua chapter 5, 14 through 15. Those are the very words God spoke to Moses at the burning bush. The Lord is with the captain, and where the Lord is, so is the angel of his presence, the Holy Spirit, a man in divine beings. How Elijah the Tishbite, an inhabitant of Ramoth and Gilead, 
an Arab Assyrian town and land east of the river of Jordan, is also a Gentile host of the Lord's host. Okay, this was a little involved, and I'm really trying to press through. So I'll, I'll just uh, refer you to the book where this comes from. It's called Isaiah 53, The Day of the Lord. It's about 280 some odd pages. It has a long, almost 35 page summary of one paragraph of each chapter, which is uh, really helpful. But it's, it's a lot more than just Isaiah 53. <clears throat> and God dictated it to me, as he dictated the Torah to Moses. How Ezekiel is the host of the Lord's host, a man in divine names. This is uh, Ezekiel, it's in quotes. I'll give you the chapter and verse in a second. And he said to me, O mortal, stand on your feet that I may speak to you. As he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet. And I heard what was being spoken to me. To God, they show God saying those words, but see, you can't hear them. So the Spirit is in him, and God is in his Spirit. He tells us, the angel, obey him, because my name, I am in him. This is God speaking to Ezekiel, but Ezekiel does not hear God speaking until at the same moment the Spirit enters him and sits him upon his feet. A spirit of God entering a man and God speaking means the angel of God's presence, who is spirit, alighted upon him and that God is in him. They could not believe how the Lord is symbolized in the story where he appeared and spoke to Abraham by the terebinths of Mamre as three men standing near him. The three men represent a host of the Lord's host. It's a man with divine things. It's three persons. In my case, it's the person of Keith McCarty. It's the person of God. And it's the person of the Holy Spirit. All right here. And it's not new. This is all throughout the biblical, the, the Hebrew Bible. It just wasn't revealed to you. That's why nobody can believe it when they the final prophet of God said to be Muhammad of Islam. This is from Wikipedia. This the information I'm about to give you on uh, the, the, the founder of Islam, Muhammad Mafsasa. And then I had several comments to make on all of it. When Muhammad was 40 years old, he was commanded by God through his angel Gabriel to declare his oneness. And of course, God is one began with the Jewish people and the Hebrew Bible. To the idolaters of the whole world and to deliver the message of peace to the embattled humanity. In response to this command from heaven, Muhammad launched the momentous program called Islam, which was to change the destiny of mankind forever. He was in Hira when one day the archangel Gabriel appeared before him and brought to him the tidings that God had chosen him to be his last messenger to this world and had imposed upon him the duty of leading mankind out of the welter of sin and ignorance into the light of guidance, truth, and knowledge to be a light to the world. It should sound familiar to the Jewish people. According to the accounts of this Shia Muhammad, well, I'm working on this. Again, I'm just getting started on all this. Uh, and I have a computer in front of me because my cell phone is not responding correctly this morning. And the Lord wants me to get this done. Um, 
Gabriel's not an angel. Clearly, they plagiarized the Hebrew Bible and put into the, their own cultural laws and norms and, and what they consider morality. And, uh, of course, Christianity is based around uh, a story. It's that a story. They call it the greatest story you ever told. I agree. It's a great story. Billions of people have been deceived into believing it. Now, I can understand the people of antiquity believing it. But the people today believing it? Uh, I, I, I really don't know what to say about that. I, I don't know. I don't know how you can believe God made a human sacrifice to you and by his blood, by, by, by his stripes, we are healed. Again, God made me watch Christian channels. And, and then there's this one fellow, I'll sell you the, the blessings of David. I said, well, God, what, what are the blessings of David? I'm thinking. And he said, there are no blessings of David. He's making it up. People believe him. They send their names in with money, and he says their name on the air, and that's what they really want. So, but there is no angel Gabriel. He only appears in the book of Daniel. He only appears in the book of Daniel, uh, who is not a prophet, and it is not a book of the prophets. And he doesn't speak with God. That's what a prophet is. And even Jesus calls him a prophet and uh, quotes him as a prophet, and he's not. Um, it's just story. I mean, come on. A bunch, of, a bunch of men standing in a kiln that's burning hotter than the sun, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> I get it. It's not going to happen. But you read the same things, the, the, the leaders of Judaism read the same kind of absolute, that can't happen. But because they like it, and they say our sages believe that, we believe it. Well, your sages lived in another time. Michael Scobat, Jews for Judaism, who also claims Isaiah 53, is the Jewish people as one man, Israel, as one man. They had gathered and crushed by disease and offered themselves so guilty at some time in history that I'm unfamiliar with. Because he doesn't say it's something that's going to happen. They act as though it already happened. See, uh, tell you a thing about Reese Judaism believes it happened in World War II with the Holocaust. But that was just six million. That wasn't all the Jews of the world gathered as one man in Israel. They didn't get long life. They didn't see the children. They didn't teach righteousness. Neither did Hitler, he's the one that offered them as these grand sacrifices because he reads an offering of oneself for guilt to literally mean, these are his words, it literally means a guilt offering. Let's go to Leviticus. Now, he doesn't say let's go to Leviticus. He says it's a guilt offering, but a guilt offering is an unblemished ram for theft or destruction of holy things, debts. It, what that has to do with anything, I don't know. Because he's, he's an anti-missionary, he's, he's pointing this interpretation of 53 away from Isaiah 53. But they, you know, they think they're forgiven of sin. They, they're not worried about theft <laughs> and destruction of holy things. They're not worried about that. They don't know what he's doing, except reaching. Really, really reaching. I think... The description of a man marred so 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 much beyond human appearance, semblance, um, and, and all these this you know plague afflicted that the Holocaust just grabbed him, and he just made it fit. Well, that's what the Christians do. They make Jesus fit. They can they can argue with me on every single verse. And if you've read, uh, watched my six videos on 53 26 videos some of them were just a half an hour but um, there's a lot to it and i'm the only person who's ever explained it this way is anybody who watches it that's familiar with 53 and uh, the commentators on it today you realize nobody's read it like this and nobody's ever connected the story of ezekiel to it and you know this atheist Pretty smart guy, but uh, 
You know, it's just like in Malachi 3. Every time God had me read it, I said, why is that angel leaving earth? <laughs> he wouldn't tell me. I didn't know until I typed it. I didn't get it. I didn't put these things together. I certainly didn't put Jeremiah into it. Uh, in this new code, I, I read the new code and it just, huh, it just went on. It didn't even mean anything to me. Because I had no background in anything. Except for the Ten Commandments and Charlton Heston. It's a great show. But there's been some better Ten Commandments since. I've seen them all. But anyway, Gabriel appears in, I think it's two chapters, and he's described as a man. A man. Gabriel, a man. And it's in a vision. It's not, it's not something where God says in heaven, I have angels, and it's the angel Gabriel, and uh, Archangel so-and-so, the fallen angel, Lucifer. Um, you, you can't find that in the Hebrew Bible. Yeah. It came from Christianity. So, so Islam, which didn't begin until the 700s, common there. I think that's the date here. Um, with Muhammad, long after Christianity, which would have been no, before the Talmud was put together, Judaism, when it really became formal, was with the Talmud, I would suppose, and putting the entirety of the Hebrew, by all the scrolls together and canonizing. <clears throat> and um, it looks like they plagiarized both books. Both books. And like I said, put their own cultural laws, rules, morality, and philosophy into it, but taking the basis. There's, there's Abraham. He's in it. And now, I don't know if Muhammad is supposed to be a descendant of him or not. But here's what happened. So, he is, uh, he says he's the last messenger, the last prophet of God. That's what's on their mind. It's not the last messenger, it's the last prophet of God. According to the account of Shia Muslims, Muhammad Mustafa, far from being surprised or frightened by the appearance of Gabriel, welcomed him as if he had been expecting him. Gabriel brought the tidings that Allah had chosen him to be the last messenger to mankind and congratulated him on being selected to become the recipient of the greatest of all honors for a mortal in this world from Al-Islam, the birth of Islam and the proclamation by Muhammad of his mission. That's in Wikipedia. Muslims believe that the Quran was orally revealed by God to the final prophet, Muhammad, through the Archangel Gabriel, incrementally over a period of some 23 years, beginning in 609 Common Era, when Muhammad was 40 years old. That's an oral tradition. That sounds to me. That's what the time it is. It's the oral tradition written. So it wouldn't be so it wouldn't be forgotten. The year, uh, and then he died in 632 Common Era. Muslims regard the Quran as Muhammad's most important miracle. He worked miracles like Jesus did. You know, he could bring tidal waves with fish to feed the multitudes. And Jesus said five thousand with two loaves and five fish, or, five, or two fish and five loaves, something like that, to 5,000 people. And uh, a, a, a proof, his book, the Quran, a proof that he was a prophet, that God spoke to him through Gabriel, the angel. And, the, and that this was, the Quran was the culmination of a series of divine messages starting with those revealed in Adam, of Adam and Eve, and ending with Muhammad. According to tradition, several of Muhammad's companions served as scribes and recorded the revelations. Shortly after his death, the Quran was compiled by the companions who had written down or memorized parts of it. That's from Quran in Wikipedia.
God shows his last messenger. And Allah means God, by the way. It's just not the God of the Hebrew Bible and the God of the Jews. God shows the, uh, the last prophet, the last messenger, long before the time of Muhammad, when Malachi wrote Malachi. The messenger. Is Elijah for a time to come? And the time still had not come. The land did lay desolate. But they had not returned. It did not bloom again. Until 1948. And even then, it was a desolation. It took many years to get it going and uh, re renew all the old cities like Jaffa and Haifa and Tel Aviv. <clears throat> and, uh, of course, rebuild Jerusalem. You know, it's a metropolitan, metropolitan area now. Elijah, which, of course, is me. Now, how do you think Islam is going to react to me? We already know how the Christians are going to react. Not too favorable. Not too favorable. So this, you know, David is here because I'm David. David is here. I am the Moshe. I am anointed. Which means the man of Isaiah 53 is anointed. And the anointment is the alighting of God's spirit on me. That's how I know I'm the man of chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Because there is no question that the spirit and God are within me. And that's how I know this whole concept of God is in his spirit. And I can point to scripture that says just that and explains things where it doesn't say it. Now they believe, they believe Muhammad to be a prophet because of his book. I've got two books that are dictated to me with all of this information. This is, this is chapter 49 of Isaiah 53 in the day of the Lord. See, it's not just about Isaiah 53. Now, the last chapter is the day of the Lord, and I'm going to do that probably on a separate video. I may make this uh, another two half-hour recordings on my camera will take. So, God's righteous servant, me. I am the final prophet, not Muhammad, and as the final prophet, and with the God of the Jews being the being the uh, Abraham uh, and Judaism, being the Abrahamic uh, religion that is correct. There's three. I mean, if you really sit back and think about it, who, who's going to win that? Who's going to win? There's three. Are the Christians going to win it with their human sacrifice? Are the Muslims going to win it? When, I, when clearly there's, it's just a plagiarization, they're going to be a light to the world. Peace and humanity. And they got there by stealing somebody else's book. They took the book of the children of God also. The Christians attached it. At least they didn't attach it to the Koran. You know, I mean, that's a plus in their favor, I suppose. I'm going to go ahead and start in the chapter 50. But they, I, I didn't know all that. I didn't know that they were using an angel that doesn't exist. And he doesn't. I've been in, to heaven and vision and told and no uncertain terms that there's no such angels. There's no Michael. There's no Lucifer. There's no fallen angel. It's just part of the story because that's what the people in antiquity and, and today too to an extent you just like to believe in that. The, the Christians got so much jumbled up in their minds. So much of the religion conflicts and doesn't make sense. And they've got entire armies of demonic forces that are at war with God. This and that, I promise you. I know his power like the back of my hand. And uh, they, they, he, there's no contending with him. Whatever he thinks he is. He's willed it. Gone. You know. <laughs> He can take this world and turn it into a pea, the size of a pea, just by thinking it. He set off the big bang. That's how Genesis starts out. He divides uh, light from dark and this and that. Yeah. We're, we're the dark. That, and the division is the platform of heaven. 
And we're, we know we're in the dark because he had to put suns in there for us. So there, it's kind of a blend. You have to look. The first, the, the universe, his universe, the unseen realm, and then and then the real, the real, the universe of real, which is like, you know, sol uh, objects, solid things, stuff you can see, came with the Big Bang. And uh, it's all within his original unseen realm. So it, we're, we're a universe in a universe. It's not parallel universes, just one inside of another. Totally different from each other. Science totally different. We can never see the unseen realm except what he would place in our minds. I mean, he can place an angel Gabriel in my mind if he wanted to and have me believe it, and I would. But he doesn't. He's very real and matter of fact. Um, and, and, and the fact that this, at this time, people are still believing the things of the people of antiquity who they didn't know anything. They didn't know anything, and they had, and they couldn't back. They couldn't go in there and say, "Well, I don't check that out. I don't know about that." <laughs> you know, they couldn't. There's no bookstores, no schools, no teachers. About all you could learn from the wise man was the Hebrew Bible for the Jews, and they spent their life in that book. Well, I had it. I read it for the story reading when I was fifty, and it's only because God was teaching me that that I had the knowledge that I do have. Um. It's just not possible that any man could do that. And I know I could. So anyway, the day of the Lord. Now this is interesting because I had kind of forgotten this entire chapter. The term day of the Lord appears in the books of Isaiah, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Amos, Obadiah, Zephaniah, and finally in the last book of the prophets, Malachi. In Ezekiel and Zechariah, the day of the Lord is said to be only against the nations, and then Obadiah against Edom and Esau, Christianity, and the nations. If you see Edom and Esau, it's Christianity. That's, that's just Judaism. If you're going to take their book, take all of it. Take the old tradition with it, Christians. One, they go together. The prophets warn that the day of the Lord is near, but it is not the end of the world. Now, this is true of the Essenes, too, the, uh, the sect of, uh, of Jews who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. But and, and with the same concept, evil's going to be gone, but the good stays. Uh, um, the destiny of the world will be, will be changed. God returns to the earth to dwell among his people in his sanctuary, which he's doing, on his holy mount, Zion, in Jerusalem, and the world will know that he sanctifies Israel. Lo, the day of the Lord is coming with pitiless fury and wrath to make the earth a desolation. To wipe out the sinners upon it. Isaiah 13 and 9. You say, well, see, that's not, you, you haven't been talking about that day of the Lord. Yes, I have. God's final word on it. Because that's not going to happen. That, 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 again, that's just fun to read. It scares people, man. Whoa, you know, war's coming kind of a thing. For a day is near, a day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of cloud, an hour of invading nations. A sword shall pierce Egypt, and Nubia shall be seized with trembling. When men fall slain in Egypt, and her wealth is seized, and her foundations are overthrown, Nubia, Put, and Lud, these are, these are names for, the ter for territories that are pre-biblical for the most, they're pre-Abraham. The Hebrew. And all the mixed populations and cub and the inhabitants of the allied country shall fall by the sword with them. Ezekiel. Ezekiel has an account of all the tribes returning to the promised land and they go all go individually back to the lots of their ancestors. 
the reign of sinister. Do you know how many? It is impossible to determine that. Randam says, I can do it. I can tell you no, I can. He says, I do it by a spirit and has no concept whatsoever that God is in his spirit. That the spirit that alights upon me is one of being able to determine your ancestry all the way back to the to the partitioning of the promised land and to the tribe you should belong to that you have the most blood of. Okay. Sounds great to make you I'm sure people will love it, but uh, not that I have not that I have them back. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, that David's here, the peace in the world. I'm here. You, it's, a, it's just about undeniable. This is like a hundred times more proof than Moses said. You know, it, nobody even knew he was writing the first, the Torah. Nobody, I'm sure nobody knew. And if they didn't know, they didn't care. And the fact that God was telling them, they may have believed, they may not have. Any of them would, would, would ask him, how do we know you're talking to God? Today, he say, well, read this. It's called Leviticus. You think I woke up and wrote God's laws without him telling me what to do? Because I thought that's what he was telling? That's the Christian. I'm getting the word. I'm getting the word from the word. For some reason, they call Jesus the word before he came into body. <coughs> so they get a word from the word. I, I, the word, I think, means God. I'm not, I'm not sure. But everyone who invokes the name of the Lord shall escape, for there shall be a remnant on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, as the Lord promised. Anyone who invokes the Lord will be among the survivors. That's from Job. For I have noted how many of your crimes and how countless your sins, you enemies of the righteous, you takers of bribes, you who subvert, subvert in the gate, the cause of the needy. Assuredly, at such a time, the prudent man keeps silent, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live, and that the Lord, the God of hosts, may truly be with you, as you think, hate evil. So here's some morality in a great story. Hey, the Lord, and love good, and establish justice in the gate. Again, the Essenes had gates. People like to hang out at them, as you can imagine, and tell stories. And what else are they going to do if they have enough food and everything? And be and have all your friends clapping you on the back. Great stuff. Great stuff. Look at all those Gentiles gathering around. Tell us Jesus' story. Tell us Jesus' story. They, 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 look at them. They, they get all giddy. And he's some money. Yeah, it could have. Could be like right that. And uh, I got a real long, I'm going to skip this one from Zechariah, but, but finishing up with Zephaniah on this uh, uh, coming of the end of evil. And I will bring distress upon them that they should walk like blind men because they had been sinned against the Lord. And their blood should be poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung. Okay, okay you know, let me read a little bit of this one. This is from Jack O'Brien. Now, see, this is like watching a zombie movie. This is like watching a heart show. And we are, you know, most people love to see those every so often, especially as uh, when you're young. As for those people that warred against Jerusalem, the Lord will smite them with this plague. Their flesh shall rot away while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall rot in their sights. And their tongues shall rot away in their mouths. In that day, a great panic from the Lord shall fall upon them. And everyone shall snatch at the hand of another. And everyone raise his hand against everyone else. Jews shall join the fighting in Jerusalem. The same plague shall strike the horses, the mules, the camels, and the asses. The plague shall affect all the animals in those camps. And on and on. Malachi 3 brings a new concept to the day of the Lord. Why is that? 
because it's not going to be in antiquity in Jesus' time. It's not going to be in the Middle Ages. It's going to be in the age of the internet, knowledge, science, medicine, common sense, or as I right, reasoning, and in the like in there. But it's still fun to read. This is the thing he was writing for antiquity because this is the kind of stuff they, they not only, they would believe these stories. And, and uh, today, we don't believe them. We just think, wow, that's fun to read. So God was writing it for different areas. He, he wrote for antiquity in the Middle Ages. And then we had the Age of Enlightenment kicking off in about 1600. Computers in 1960. To today, age of the internet. So, what what new concept in the day of the Lord does Malachi bring? It's God's final word on the day that He's preparing where the new covenant is delivered. And again, He knew they were going to be, be dispersed, and apparently, He had a pretty good idea when they would be coming back. Okay, this, it's the final word of God. Not only on the day of the Lord, but with the new covenant. What's he saying? What, what, what's really happening? Get away from all these fun stories. He's coming with a covenant of friendship. He says, you're going to be safe from now on. The nations of the world is going to know I sanctified the Jews. The Jews were correct about the Abrahamic religions. Going to build a temple which shows I have sanctified you. Because nobody's going to want you to build it. You know, uh, the Gentiles of the northern kingdom, imported by Assyria, didn't want the second temple built. They, they, they obstructed the building of it and tried to stop it completely with letters to Cyrus <clears throat> or to whoever was leading Persia that, at the time they sent the letters. Um, and he says, uh, New Covenant, everybody's going to be sin free, Holy Seed, Holy Seed, and since he did the same thing, with the uh, exiles, he, he never says, I'm making you a holy seed to build the temple. He never does say that. But that is what happened. And it's going to happen again. He's going to have that temple built, I don't know, 10, 20 years from now. I, I don't know. Presumably before I die. But now David, he died before, before the building of the first temple. Although he had a lot to do with gathering all the materials for it and the wealth that went into it. And, and Solomon had a, had a home to the honor. There's always a lot of things happening again that are real. As a matter of fact, it took longer to build Solomon's house than the temple. So, he must have had a pretty honorable abode, right? <laughs> that and God talked to him. Um, now, God doesn't address the nations. As I started out, these different days of the Lord's in the various books, some are just pointing at Christianity, some is the nations. Uh, you know, they're kind of different. But Malachi 3 is real clear. It's the Jewish people, the people of the land of Israel, as much as anything. Um, that's the focus. When I come back, you know, the sanctuary to be placed amongst his people in Jerusalem. Although the covenant, uh, the French covenant does not say in Jerusalem. I think that's pretty much implied. Although, as David, see, David purchased the temple not for God after he had failed the test that God put him to it as kind of a uh, making up for it. I, I, I've also been saying, and uh, I can go by. There's people who have raised millions of dollars to the building of the third temple out there right now. Just on the belief it will happen. God will come. They just don't know how because of the false teachings. Teaching of antiquity. The teaching teachings for people of antiquity. Well, the people today aren't of antiquity. Compared to those people, they are all brilliant geniuses. Every single person who has a computer is a brilliant genius. Knowledgeable. <laughs> Over these people. So... Here's God. Not only is he saying something different than your traditional day of the Lord, he's saying in future times, 
in the times where man is more enlightened, knowledgeable, we just going to build things where it is. And everybody's going to be safe because it, that that's just going to keep people from picking on you as much as they are, and they'll have it in their minds. Just don't mess with them. That God could be in there. <laughs> God might be there after all. Keep the keep the Middle East at bay, and of course. You know, when I die, that's not to say God's not going to continue on them, as he did with Solomon, with uh, with Elijah, Elijah, uh, that was followed up by Elisha. Uh, the Davidic dynasty was supposed to continue the line of David, but I don't believe there's anything that, well, his covenant does. Well, my son's a great guy, and I says, you really want, would you want me to put him through that, what you've been through? And I thought, of, <laughs> I said, yeah, that'd be good for him. <laughs> I mean, I really wouldn't wish, I wouldn't wish that pain on anybody. But it changes to so much for the good. And you know, you can't really feel another person's pain. I know that pain. I still live in it. You can't imagine what happened to me just two months ago. No, oh, I can't, I'm not allowed to tell you, and I wouldn't tell you. But, um... It was brutal. I, I, it, it, went to, it went from, I had my top five things that he's done to me, and it moved up to, it, it went by everybody.